In the moments before she lost her life, Eurydice Dixon took off her black leather shoes, slipped off her socks, and walked barefoot across Prince's Park. It was a June night in Melbourne, Australia, but she welcomed the cold feeling and clipped the grass on her soles. This had become a happy, unguarded ritual for a woman who thought of the park as her sanctuary, a place where nothing bad would ever happen. But in those same moments, evil was watching from across the street. James Todd didn't know Eurydice, but he had his attention fixated on her. For nearly an hour, James had carefully followed her through the city, and with each step, a dark, obsessive fantasy had grown in his mind. From the opposite side of Royal Parade, James watched as the girl in the long black dress left the well-lit footpath and entered the darkened park. He followed her for over an hour before sexually assaulting her and ending her life. In the days after Dixon's body was found, her black shoes discarded not too far from where her body lay, Australia recoiled in grief and horror at what had happened to this bright and talented young woman. Eurydice Jane Dixon was born to Jeremy Dixon and Karen Walters on November 10th, 1995. Eurydice's father, Jeremy, was described as an anarchist and political activist, and so was his wife, Karen, Eurydice's mother. But sadly, Eurydice was only seven when her mum passed away. Karen struggled with heroin addiction and reportedly died in a shopping centre in Brunswick. The family got to know one fateful morning when the police knocked at the door to inform them that Karen's lifeless body had been found in a shopping centre. So Jeremy was left to look after his children, Eurydice and Polly. Eurydice grew up in a commission flat in a suburb called Parkville in Melbourne, and she was described as shy, curious, thoughtful, and a remarkable woman. She was also funny and a very strong feminist. Her sister Polly said that she was clever, gutsy, and determined, and this was obvious to everyone who was ever blessed enough to get to know her. Eurydice attended Princess Hills Secondary College for high school, where she was a target for bullies. She had a pretty hard time at the school because she was perceived as being strange. In her teens, she would discuss and talk about subjects no one of her age talked about, so some of her mean colleagues saw her as too smart and always picked on her because they felt intimidated. But Eurydice had a plan. She was a creative soul and wanted to study drama at Deakin University in Melbourne, and she did. While there, she joined the Burwood Student Theatre Company, a theatre company run by the students at Deakin University. She played the part of Justine in an Australian-British play called Cosi in 2014. She was also part of the Moreland Theatre Company, an immature theatre company in the northern suburbs of Melbourne, which was really close to where she lived. Within that theatre company, she performed in RMIT's yearly Snatches, a run of short plays. So you could tell that Eurydice was really happy. She had a bunch of great friends and she had gotten a new boyfriend by the name of Tony Magnusson. Eurydice seemed to be really close with her dad and her sister, maybe because they were kind of like the only people she had left after the sad demise of her mum. When Eurydice decided that as well as acting, she wanted to double in comedy, she was supported by everyone around her, and she was good at what she did. When doing comedy shows, Eurydice would cover topics such as gender equality, feminism, global uprisings and other related issues, and people liked to watch her. Not many people her age were brave enough to tackle these sorts of issues in their comedy skits, which is one of the reasons why she did so well. So, she made her Melbourne International Comedy Festival debut in 2018 with a solo stand-up comedy show called At Home, I Feel Like a Tourist, at Melbourne's Highlander Bar, and you can see how bright and promising her future looks. You worry a lot. About, about, about things that I shouldn't worry about. Sometimes I worry we're going to end up in a slave society. <laughs> it was on the 12th of June, 2018, a Tuesday night, and Eurydice was very excited to perform at the comedy club at the Highlander Bar in Melbourne. She had recently started performing regularly doing her solo performance, and on this night, Eurydice was quite nervous. She would be performing some new material, 
so she just had to be tense. However, her performance went smoothly, and Dixon was absolutely thrilled. She had put in so much work into this performance, and to see it go well was all she wanted. She decided that after the show, she and her boyfriend Tony were going to have a drink at the bar to celebrate. After the celebratory drink, it was already 10.40pm, so they decided to leave the bar. After that, they got some food, and the duo made their way to Flinders Street Station. This is where they hug each other, and Eurydice kisses her lover, and then says she is going to walk all the way home. So, she started her walk home, and her boyfriend took the train. It was about an hour's walk to her home, and Eurydice decided to take a walk instead of a cab or something. It's quite understandable, because she had just had a great night, an amazing performance, and hung out with her boyfriend, so there was no better way to enjoy the rest of the day than to take a walk. She did everything right that society had always taught her to stay safe, but that wasn't enough. When Eurydice was almost home, she decided to cut through a park called Prince's Park. The streets on either side of the park were well lit, but Prince's Park was pretty big so it was actually quite dark in the park. As she entered the park, she took off her socks and shoes and continued walking. She then sent her boyfriend a text, saying, I'm almost home, how about you? But sadly, she never made it home. In the early hours of June 13th, 2018, Dixon was found dead by a passerby at Princess Park between Princess Park Drive and Royal Parade in Charlton North. In the brief window between sending that message and her body being discovered at 2.50am, she was sexually assaulted and her life was taken away. The police were called and CPR was attempted, but sadly, it was too late. Eurydice had lost her life, less than a kilometre from her home. The police immediately swung into action and discovered that the park, fortunately, had CCTV cameras. Within the day, they released images to the public of a man seen in CCTV footage in the general areas where Dixon had been seen. He was spotted walking reasonably closely behind Dixon moments before she died. And so, understandably, he was a suspect, and the police wanted to talk to this man. By that night, news of Eurydice's death had spread across the nation, along with the picture of the suspect wanted for questioning. And with that, 19-year-old James Todd turned himself in at the police station. After presenting himself to the cops, Todd said he was the one on the footage, but he claimed he had nothing to do with the crime. When the police informed him that the results of a DNA test were underway, Todd knew his game was up. So he confessed to the crime and how he hatched a plot to satisfy his sexual gratification. And through James's recount as well as the CCTV footage, police were able to put together what had happened in the early hours of June 13th, 2018. It was just after midnight on that Wednesday when James Todd was stalking Eurydice as she crossed over the grass of Prince's Park, hunting her. James had finished his hospitality class around 3pm and caught a train into the city with three of his friends from college. He tried to buy alcohol at Liquorland, but he was declined since he did not have his proof-of-age card. He would later purchase vodka and rolling papers in the company of his friends. They hung out in Batman Park, sharing his vodka around. Shortly after, one of his friends left to go home. When the vodka was finished, James bought cider, while his two remaining friends grabbed cups. Back at the park, James had bought weed from some random men sitting nearby, so he smoked two joints. At 8.30pm, the three men walked to the Southern Cross station, where they bought cola before catching a Broadmeadows bound train. One of his friends got off at the Flinders Street station. The remaining two kept heading towards Broadmeadows, where James lives with his parents in the Housing Commission. But he instead got off at New Market, leaving his friend on the train. It isn't very clear why he decided to stay in town. Maybe he was having fun and the mix of drugs and alcohol had made it easier for him to go with the internal flow of looking for more fun. He purchased tobacco and returned to the city, arriving back at Flinders Street by 10.25pm. At 10.43pm, James walked past the intersection where Eurydice and Tony were standing and continued to McDonald's. After eating, he returned to the intersection where Eurydice was saying her goodbyes to her boyfriend. 
James crossed towards the station, where he saw Eurydice walking in the opposite direction. He loitered, allowing her to pass, and followed her for roughly five kilometres through the city, determined to act on a depraved fantasy. So, Todd attacked Dixon in the dark and sexually assaulted her. There was a scuffle as Eurydice fought for her life and, in the process, left some scratch marks on his face. Todd would eventually overpower her and take her life in a gruesome way. Leaving her body in the park, he scrolled through her phone for about ten minutes and used the camera to examine the scratches on his face before falling asleep on a bench at Royal Park Station. Todd also claimed that after the attack, he defecated on a track before walking again through Prince's Park and returning to the scene of the crime, where he was directed away by the police, who had already established the crime scene. He then goes and casually eats a pie, drinks a coffee, and makes his way home. At 6.37am, Todd searched Prince's Park on his iPad and read about the discovery of a woman's body there. At 6.57am, he Google searches for strangulation and forceful porn. He goes through the results and continues searching for porn related to brunettes and curvy emo girls. Later that evening, a random guy who happened to have been watching the news saw a segment on the case of Eurydice Dixon, and within that segment, they show a photo of a man who the police are looking for to have a chat with. This guy freaks out when he discovers that the man in the photo is his friend, James Todd. So, he gets straight on the phone to call his friend to tell him that he is on the news in relation to the Eurydice Dixon case. It was at this moment that the police surprisingly received a call from a man who said he was indeed the man in the photo, but he knew nothing about the case. The police then ask him to make his way to the station to answer a couple of questions. So Todd gets his girlfriend of four years to drive him to the police station, and in an hour and twelve minutes, he's arrested for offences bothering on taking a life and sexual assault. As soon as James Todd came to the limelight after the incident, James's family sort of went underground and never did any press interviews or anything like that. Although not much is known about his mother, his dad's name is Jason, and James was born in 1999. He was one of three boys. James had an older and younger brother, and the family lived in a commission house in Broad Meadows, which is a suburb in Melbourne. Court documents described this house as an environment of rotting refuse, vermin and complete squalor. At a young age, James Todd was actually diagnosed with mild autism and also ADHD, and it seems like he really acted out a lot in school, meaning that he had to change schools more than once growing up. But Todd actually seemed like a reasonably normal teenager. He had a girlfriend and friends, and once he completed Utena school, he started a hospitality education and training course because he had always wanted to be a chef after he finished his education. He was actually still undertaking this course at the time when he came in to have that interview with the police. However, what Todd's friends and family didn't know was that he was actually addicted to porn. Jason would spend hours at night watching violent porn, including porn where the female victim was depicted as dead at the end and it's pretty interesting because it's synonymous with people who watch violent porn like this. As time goes on, they often find out that watching it isn't enough, and they want to do the real thing. While in custody, James reportedly told his father over a prison telephone that he was very disappointed at the way the crime took place. He said immediately after that he didn't feel too good, and hoped that it would be better next time. And by the word next time, he probably meant if he had had a chance to do it again, he'd do it better. It is really difficult to comprehend the fact that after being arrested, the offender was unremorseful and planned to commit the same crime if he had the opportunity. So it's only reasonable to think that if the police hadn't cracked the case and made an arrest in time, James probably would have been on the streets seeking to do a better job. Dixon's death triggered a large and loud outpour of sorrow and anger, and she became the subject of many tributes on social media. Friends of Eurydice also gathered at a regular comedy night to pay tribute to the young comedian at the Exford Hotel. Most people on social media remembered Eurydice, known as Riddy, as someone who had a bright future in comedy. 
Kaylee Christian from the Comedy Women's Association said everyone was very shocked and saddened by what had happened, including Melbourne's comedy scene. Nobody knows how to deal with it, she said. Kaylee also said many comedy gigs were cancelled on Thursday night, a day after the incident, saying people weren't feeling terribly funny. Many comedians, including Anne Edmonds, Zoe Coombs Ma, and Melbourne International Comedy Festival director Susan Provan, donated via a fundraising page set up to raise money for Eurydice Dixon's family. The Highlander Bar publicly posted the following day, We are deeply saddened and shocked by the tragic news of the death of Eurydice Dixon. She was a talented, unique, and a universally loved person, and the entire staff are shattered and heartbroken. Our heart goes out to her family, the comedy community, and everyone else who knew and loved her. She will be remembered fondly and sadly missed. Rest in peace, Eurydice. We have no further comments at this devastating time. The loudest reaction to the news was that of scores of angry and terrified women in response to the police's advice to take responsibility for your own safety by making sure that people know where you are and keep your phone in hand if you are walking alone. Freya Logan, a Melbourne local and co-host of Follow Sports Like a Girl podcast, released her thoughts on the matter, which echoes the anger that many women have felt, saying... I did not know Eurydice Dixon, but I felt her death personally. Not only myself, but a lot of women will feel the death of Eurydice Dixon personally. Not because we know her, but because her murder is the summation of fears we govern our own lives by every single day. It's winter, and it's dark by 5.30pm, which means my normal commute home is a range of a thousand thoughts about what I would do just in case. I wish we taught men to be kind and compassionate, empathetic to those outside their families. Teach them that this is not a weakness. Teach them not to murder women. On social media, lots of women activists also express their opinions. A certain tweet reads, What does it mean to take responsibility for our safety? Dress differently? Walk differently? Look out or talk to men in a certain way? Message our friends when we get home? Because we already do these things, and men continue to assault and murder us. Meanwhile, thousands of people, including Victorian State Premier Daniel Andrews, gathered for a silent vigil at the soccer pitch at Prince's Park, where her body was found. Organisers stood on the top of a ute and announced there would be time for mass action about violence against women. But this was not the time for speeches. The vigil was a moment to show love for Eurydice, the gutsy, shy entertainer, the daughter and friend who had barely entered adulthood. There were those who held candles in Eurydice's honour, who knew her as a person and not as a symbol of anything. She was a strong woman, said Nikki Barry, who was with that group from the Comedy Women's Association. Dixon was articulate and smart, with a black sense of humour. There were also schoolchildren from the same school as Eurydice, whose death was just too close to home. One said she had friends who were in the park on that fateful night Eurydice lost her life. Somehow, she hoped the vigil could reclaim the park for everyone. Just after 6pm, the floodlights were dimmed for 20 minutes, and faces were soft lit by candlelight. Everyone was quiet with their feelings and thoughts, before they broke into Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah. The vigil, which saw the gathering of strangers, was to stand for something and bear witness. And this was to remember Eurydice and to protect women's safety in public places. During the vigil, Sally Cap, the Lord Mayor of Melbourne, told reporters that the state government was going to invest in additional and upgraded CCTV cameras around the city. The Premier, Daniel Andrews, 
also asked that the Melbourne Town Hall building be lit in the colour orange between 5.30pm and 7.30pm, the same time as Monday night's vigil, Cap said. Orange is the colour the United Nations uses to symbolise a future free from violence against women and girls. The government wasn't left out too. Then Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull and opposition leader Bill Shorten attended a vigil at Parliament House in Canberra, which saw another large turnout. The following day, police noticed that offensive paint markings were at the site of the floral tributes to Eurydice. Apparently, a wannabe comedian, Andrew Nolch, a men's rights activist and host of the Indie Scientologist podcast, admitted to spraying an enormous male genitalia on the grass where her body was found. He later told the police he did it to provoke feminists and make the news a feat he achieved. Nolch was found guilty of criminal damage and sentenced to five months behind bars for vandalism in September 2018. Andrew, who is a raging conspiracy theorist, revealed on a podcast that defacing the memorial was part of a comedy act that didn't land because police state rules got in the way. He said, The whole point of comedy is just you having to be able to say freedom, he bemoaned. Andrew was originally ordered to pay $19,500 in compensation and slapped with 200 hours of community work, but was resentenced to five months in jail after he missed five shifts and breached bail by travelling overseas twice. Jeremy Dixon, Eurydice's father, wrote an affidavit saying that Andrew's prison term causes more distress as he didn't want his daughter's legacy to involve unnecessary imprisonment. I don't want the applicant's imprisonment to be part of my daughter's story and legacy. I want good things to stem from her life. That's what Mr Dixon wrote. But as anger-inducing as it is for a grown-up man to act like an entitled child, it was just that, an entitled man-child acting out. But beyond the outcry of rage felt between Eurydice's death and the vandalism of her memorial, the court case against James Todd had started. During the second day of a pre-sentence hearing, two psychologists agreed that his disorder motivated the attack rather than pre-diagnosed autism. They deferred, however, on whether he intended to murder Dixon while carrying out his fantasy. David Thomas, a forensic psychiatrist, said to the court that James told him he was not certain if he would go the whole way until the attack had started. Just to be clear, going the whole way was completing the fantasy the sexual assault, and violently taking her life? Tim Marsh, the defence lawyer, asked. Yes, Thomas replied. Forensic care psychologist James Ogloff said the then-teenager saw Eurydice's death as likely inevitable. He is someone who has watched a lot of videos of these things, he said. James had a degree of understanding of just how much force could hurt someone. He obviously knew what he was doing to harm this woman, and he did not stop. If anything, it aroused him. However, the two psychologists disagreed on James's level of remorse. Ogloff described his actions after the incident, including buying a pie and coffee that night, revisiting the crime scene, and searching the net for coercive porn and stories about Eurydice as very disturbing, though not uncommon for people living with autism. James had told Ogloff he felt absolutely nothing and didn't have any feelings. Todd revealed he was glad he was apprehended, as the attack didn't turn out as he had planned. Thomas said James began to understand the damage he had caused to Dixon's friends and family once in custody. James cried as Dixon's sister read a statement to the court. Eurydice's sister had told the man who was responsible for the death of the aspiring comedian that the incident had completely shattered her family. As Polly Cotton, Eurydice's sister, confronted Todd on the first day of his two-day plea hearing, she wept. I want to see her, feel her, hear her, be with her, and hang out with her. But because you took her life, I will never see her again, Polly said. I often wish I could have saved her. I suffer from PTSD so any mention of sexual assault or death makes me freeze up in terror. Unfortunately, the strongest emotion I feel is anger. My rage is irrational, and this has shattered and destroyed my family, she added. 
Eurydice's boyfriend Tony also spoke, saying he too suffered from PTSD and that the heinous crime had stripped him of his faith in humanity. When I fall asleep, I wake up to the sound of a scream. It's difficult to look at the human race the same way again. James sat quietly with his eyes shut for long periods of the proceedings and wept while the victim impact statements were read out. Justice Kay brought up that there were poor prospects of addressing his sexual disorder and therefore he had extremely limited opportunities for rehabilitation. The judge also said James's autism was not a contributing factor to the crime and he would pose a major threat to the community if he was released. He was satisfied that James had fully intended to kill Eurydice. This was only highlighted as the 24 hours surrounding his vicious attack were explored and exposed that day. Even with all of this being revealed, James stood silently with his eyes closed, seeming completely cold and emotionless. He pleaded guilty to charges levelled against him. You waited until Eurydice was well into the dark reaches of Prince's Park before attacking her. There was no evidence that your vicious act has trolled your conscience. Justice Kay said, as he handed down a sentence of 11 years behind bars for violent sexual assault, 7 years for attempted sexual assault, and another 2 years for sexual assault. These sentences are to be served consecutively within a further life sentence, which means Todd will spend no less than 35 years behind bars. The man who raped and murdered Melbourne woman Eurydice Dixon has been sentenced to life in jail. 20-year-old James Todd pleaded guilty to following, attacking and strangling Ms Dixon as she walked home in June last year. However, after the sentencing, Eurydice's dad, Jeremy Dixon, displayed an extraordinary show of compassion, saying Eurydice should be remembered differently. Eurydice herself uh, should be remembered as her friends will remember her for her wit and her courage and uh, for her kindness, not, 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 not for her death. Jeremy expressed gladness that the offender was off the street, but expressed sympathy for those who love him. What I'd wish for James Todd, and what I believe Eurydice would wish, is that he gets better. I extend my sympathy, my own sincere sympathy for those who love him. Uh, it's a terrible tragedy all round. In 2020, James appealed his sentence. Eurydice Dixon's evil killer is appealing his life sentence with a court told James Todd's good character and youth weren't given enough consideration. Lawyers for the sadistic murderer argued his crime didn't warrant 35 years behind bars. Todd's lawyers argued that his remorse, guilty plea, dysfunctional upbringing and being on the autism spectrum meant his sentence was manifestly excessive. They also said that his sentence was disproportionate to the severity of his crimes. But Chief Justice Anne Ferguson said that given James's limited prospects for rehabilitation and the seriousness of his offence, a life sentence with 35 years minimum was appropriate, and still is. Continuing to describe what he did as loathsome and cruel, Chief Justice Ferguson said a young woman should be able to walk home alone after a night out without any fear of being harmed, let alone subjected to a vile sexual attack and gruesomely losing her life. Eurydice's death was truly one that shook the nation. It was met by an outpouring of grief and anger from men and women alike who live every day with the fear that the same thing could happen to them. On March 17th, 2019, the Victorian government announced that they will be doing an annual $5,000 stand-up grant for rising female comedians in memory of Eurydice. Susan Provan, who is the director of the Melbourne International Comedy Festival, said the stand-up grant is inspired by the ambition of Eurydice Dixon, a much-loved emerging comedian whose friends remember her as brave, beautiful and brilliant. Unafraid to delve into challenging material, and a big, bold laugh that would fill the room. Please visit our online video course that will teach you everything you need to know about self-defence. 50% of all sales will be donated to a women's charity that combats domestic violence. Link to the programme is in the description below.